In continuation to my earlier video on airline deregulation in the United States, we now examine how air travel was similarly deregulated in the British aviation market. The first airlines established in Great Britain, much like the United States, comprised a series of small carriers developed by either groups of businessmen or pilots using a fleet of contemporary airliners, with the Instone Airline and Handley Page Transport being established as early as 1919. However, as the market share in domestic and international UK air travel was much smaller than America, consolidation of carriers happened much faster, and by 1935 the UK airline industry comprised two primary operators, Imperial Airways and the original British Airways. Imperial Airways was the flag carrier of the United Kingdom, operating long-haul services to the colonies of the British Empire using a vast array of flying boats, while British Airways primarily used land-based airliners and were only limited to the UK domestic market and cross-channel services to Europe. On September 3rd, 1939, war was declared between Britain and Nazi Germany following the latter's invasion of Poland, and after a period of cooperation between British Airways and Imperial Airways, the two firms were merged by Parliament to become the state-controlled British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC. While private and commercial flight had been restricted by the British government, BOAC continued to operate both domestic and long-haul operations throughout the conflict, often under enemy fire, until peace was finally made in 1945 following Germany's defeat. On January 1st, 1946, the newly elected Attlee government lifted the wartime restrictions on civil aviation, but BOAC remained the state-controlled international carrier for the UK, while non-military routes to continental Europe, previously operated by the Royal Air Force Transport Command, were handed over to British European Airways, or BEA, a domestic arm of BOAC that was formed as part of the Civil Aviation Act of March 1946. As the two state-owned national carriers of the UK, BOAC and BEA were allowed a statutory monopoly on both international and domestic services on the British market, while also granting BEA control over the surviving pre-war regional carriers from August 1st, including Railway Air Services, Allied Airways and British Channel Island Airways, which would operate under their own brands until fully incorporated in 1947. BOAC and BEA soaked up the British passenger airline market, with BOAC becoming the face of the UK's international operations on the famous Empire routes, as well as the lucrative transatlantic run to Canada and the USA, while BEA worked corridor flights between Britain and Europe, among the most profitable being the vital London to Paris service. During this period, most independent carriers comprised short-haul airlines or ad hoc charter companies equipped with ex-military aircraft such as Douglas Dakotas left over from World War II with the likes of Dan Air, established in 1953, primarily operating non-scheduled services within the UK, long-haul personnel flights to the oil fields of the Middle East and Africa, or military charter flights to West Berlin. By 1960, the two state-owned UK carriers had become hugely successful, seeing well over 2 million passengers per year, while also remaining at the forefront of aviation technology, with the introduction of the Boeing 707 and Vickers VC-10 long-haul airliners, and the BAC-111 and Hawker Siddeley Trident regional jets. However, due to a mixture of state funding, combined with the comfortable position being held by their monopoly, both BOAC and BEA were loss-making firms, but saw no need to improve or streamline their work practices, as their dominance was secured through the intervention of the Air Transport Advisory Council, or ATAC, the contemporary UK government department in charge of air transport to economic regulation. ATAC was the primary tool by which BEA and BOAC maintained their monopoly during the 1950s, as it was the government arm in charge of permitting private carriers the ability to operate flights on trunk domestic and international routes, a notable example of their control being in November 1958, when they were approached by the independent carrier British Eagle, who intended to operate low-cost scheduled flights to Cyprus, Gibraltar, Malta, Singapore and the Caribbean, as well as to East and West Africa. Examples of the low fares British Eagle proposed included providing a service to Malta at a cost of £19, or £447 in 2020, as opposed to BEA's £52 fare, or £1,224 in 2020, while the Singapore run would cost £199, or 4684 in 2020, while BOAC's fare cost £351, or 8262 in 2020. As the first attempt by an independent carrier to undercut the state airlines, British Eagle argued that the market had stagnated under BOAC and BEA, and thus increasing the British share on routes the state airlines had monopolised would stimulate demand and fuel the UK economy. But the state carriers saw this proposal as a significant threat, and therefore lodged an objection with ATAC, 
resulting in permission being ultimately denied for British Eagle to start these services. The control held by the state airlines, though, was not one universally accepted, both within the government and across the private sector, and following pressure from consumer groups and customers regarding the continued rise in airfares due to the captive market these carriers held, Parliament, under the Macmillan government, enacted the Civil Aviation Licensing Act of 1960, which replaced ATAC with the Air Transport Licensing Board, or ATLB, an arm of the government whose purpose was, ostensibly, to allow independent airlines equal opportunities to develop scheduled routes in their own right. With the introduction of the Act in 1960, several smaller carriers quickly merged to form airlines with enough cumulative capital to compete with BOAC and BEA, resulting in the creation of British United Airways that same year and Caledonian Airways in 1961. The ATLB, however, was merely a smokescreen that itself was subject to abuse by both the state airlines and the government, being able to grant route licensing to independent carriers who applied to run flights on trunk services, but needed to be convinced that the carrier would be able to garner an economically viable number of passengers, stood to make a suitable profit, and would open up new air corridors rather than diverting traffic from the state airlines. An early example of this abuse was when British United proposed the start of direct flights between London Gatwick and Paris Le Bourget, as while the company held a license to operate the route, awarded by the ATLB in 1961, the airline wasn't able to use it without actual traffic rights, though this was mainly due to the French authorities not seeing a corresponding reduction in BEA's share of the London-Paris flights. Despite the continued interference of the ATLB, Britain's many private carriers saw substantial growth throughout the 1960s, with British United, Caledonian and Dan Air opening up new routes on the emerging holiday services to Spain, Italy, France and North Africa while also introducing jet airliners to adequately compete with the state airlines for speed and comfort. With this, the loss-making state airlines began to suffer greatly, despite their objections lodged with the ATLB, and even though the government granted BOAC and BEA interest-free subsidies to keep the airlines operating, they were also the authority that strong-armed their decisions when it came to certain airliner purchases in order to support British industry, in spite of these decisions making little economic sense. For instance, BOAC, despite its objections, were forced into purchasing the Vickers VC-10, even though it was a highly inefficient and specialist airliner created to serve a small number of airports, while attempts by BEA to reorganize its fleet to fully incorporate American-built models, which were comparatively more efficient, were blocked by Parliament, thus forcing them to buy more Tridents and BAC-111s. Regardless, in 1967, the continued losses of the two state firms, together with the somewhat incompatible work practices and requirements of each, forced the Wilson government to establish the Edwards Committee, a panel formed under the eponymous Sir Ronald Edwards, in order to determine the future of British civil air travel. In 1969, the committee recommended the formation of a National Air Holding Board to control the finances and policies of the two corporations, with long-term solutions being to merge the two firms into a single carrier under the British Airways Board, while the near-monopoly held by the state carriers, nearly 90% of all UK scheduled air transport capacity by the end of the 1960s, would be counterbalanced by a second force of private carriers, essentially creating a multi-airline market similar to that of the USA. Proposals to merge BOAC and BEA had dated back to 1953, when disputes arose as to the negotiation of air rights through the British colony of Cyprus, with one solution being to merge the two firms in order to end the deadlock and strengthen operations to the vital oil-producing countries of the Middle East, but this was blocked by the Treasury and a resolution negotiated between the two carriers. With regard to the wider management of civil aviation across the UK, the committee also recommended that the ATLB be replaced by the Civil Aviation Authority, or CAA, a statutory body, which would oversee all aspects regarding non-military air travel within the UK, including the supervision of pilots' licences, the managing of security standards, and the regulation of carrier licences through its arm, the Air Travel Organisers Licensing, or ATOL. Based on these recommendations, they were passed into law on August 12, 1971, under the Civil Aviation Act, and the process began to merge the two state airlines into the new British Airways, while also granting more powers to their private rivals. By this point, BOAC had ordered a new fleet of Boeing 747-100 wide-body airliners, while also being a proposed launch customer for Concorde, a supersonic airliner that had been in development since the late 1950s and was expected to be launched in 1976. For private carriers, British Caledonian, which was formed through the merger of British United and Caledonian Airways in 1970, had become the largest independent airline on the UK market, followed closely by Dan Air, while many of the routes left over following the collapse of British Eagle in 1968 
were taken up by Laker Airways, which was moving to convert its operations from charter travel to long-haul low-cost services. After nearly three years of joint operation, BOAC and BEA were officially merged into British Airways on April 1, 1974, inheriting a motley fleet of both British and American-built airliners that were in need of replacement. As such, the board invested heavily in new models such as the Boeing 757, due for launch in the early 1980s, but didn't purchase the Airbus A300 wide-body twin jet, as elements of the BEA management continued to begrudge the British government's axing of the BAC-211 project, in which BEA had invested large amounts of capital in support of its development, and thus stubbornly refused to take on the type, despite the insistence of Parliament, who wanted to use BA's introduction of the A300 as a means of smoothing over the UK's entry into the European Union. In 1976, the government once again intervened when dividing up the British airline market among the private and state carriers, granting British Caledonian sole access to the Latin and South American markets by handing over those routes formerly operated by British Airways, in exchange for their withdrawal from East African services and the lucrative London to New York and Los Angeles runs. But this move ultimately doomed the company, as it stripped them of their more profitable services, leading to a protracted demise that ended when British Airways purchased the firm in 1988. The attempt to centralise the state carrier on the highly profitable international trunk routes, however, was not enough to allow British Airways to climb out of its significant loss on the domestic market, as with the removal of most regulations on licensing under the Act of 1971, smaller domestic carriers, such as British Midland and Dan Air, were easily undercutting BA and sweeping up passengers, leading to their exponential growth. While British Airways attempted to redress the balance through a greater slant on business-orientated travel, it was still operated and priced non-competitively. Its problems exacerbated further by a lack of cohesion between the former BEA and BOAC airline unions, resulting in poor worker relations and frequent strikes. Matters were made worse once Concorde had been launched in 1976, as while this supersonic airliner was a marvel of modern aviation, it operated at a near constant loss, being only able to carry 100 passengers at twice the fuel consumption of other aircraft, and was restricted to only transatlantic operations due to opposition by foreign governments fearing the effects of sonic booms. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and with her new Conservative government at the helm, brought about a sweeping series of privatisations in order to reduce the number of state firms and industries being supported by the taxpayer. British Airways was among the most notable financial black holes in the government, with net profits for the firm falling from £70 million in 1978 to £20 million in 1979 to a loss of £141 million in 1980 while the net debt had increased to over £1 billion. Thus, in 1981, under the management of newly appointed CEO Sir John King, the firm was prepared for privatisation. The ways in which King chose to improve the airline's finances was to see substantial reductions in staff numbers through early retirement, redeployment and voluntary redundancies, a full modernisation of the BA fleet that would root out older, more inefficient models such as the VC-10 and the Trident, and would replace them with new models such as the upcoming Boeing 757 and 767, full purchase of the seven Concorde aircraft from the government in order to bring them under complete control of the airline, and thus remove payments by British Airways in order to lease them from the Department for Transport, and a full refurbishment of control systems and terminal facilities through the building of Heathrow Terminal 4, a dedicated hub for BA operations. British Airways remained a public corporation until April 1984, when it was changed to a public limited company, or PLC, and plans were made to float the firm on the stock market, but the process of full privatisation was delayed, following a significant financial hit due to a lawsuit filed against the company by Laker Airways to the tune of $1 billion. Laker, which had collapsed into administration in February 1982, accused British Airways, together with British Caledonian, Pan Am, TWA, Lufthansa, Air France, Swissair, KLM, SAS, Sabina, Alitalia and UTA, of conspiracy to force the low-cost long-haul carrier out of business through predatory pricing and threats made against McDonnell Douglas and General Electric to boycott these firms in the event they provided Laker with a £5 million rescue package, this having been uncovered by British Caledonian, who subsequently informed the other carriers. Therefore, privatisation of British Airways was pushed back from the original date of 1985 to 1987, but this delay did allow for the company to unveil a new business-orientated image developed in conjunction with San Francisco-based brand consultancy Landor Associates, the results of which completely changed the face of the airline and helped to make it one of the most popular and profitable carriers in the world.
The freedom from the government regulations also allowed British Airways to seek a greater influence on the global aviation market through the purchase of rivals, including the aforementioned British Caledonian in 1988 and Danair in 1992, and the establishment of minority interests in foreign carriers, including TAT of France, Deutsche BA of Germany, Qantas of Australia, US Air, and Air Russia, acquisitions which, together with the BCAL merger, added up to a pattern of business conduct that would have been virtually impossible under state ownership. As for the wider private sector, the encouragement of the government to foster competition against the state airlines in the 1971 Civil Aviation Act allowed for initial widespread expansion of secondary and low-cost carriers, all of which were allowed to compete with British Airways at their own gain or risk. However, as the British airline market is small and heavily influenced by European-based airlines, together with various air travel market downturns caused by the attacks of 9-11 and the 2008 credit crunch, the UK market is now much more heavily dependent on low-cost carriers such as EasyJet and Jet2, while traditional domestic carriers such as Flybe and British Midland were unable to compete and were either required or went bankrupt. British Airways remains the overarching flag carrier, and Virgin Atlantic has climbed from a low-cost, no-frills long-haul company, similar to Laker Airways, to a viable competitor on trunk business routes across the Northern Hemisphere, while other flag carriers and low-cost carriers from Europe, including Air France, KLM, Ryanair, Lufthansa and TUI, also take their own share of the UK airline market. Overall, the deregulation of the UK airline market has been a mixed bag of success. As well as has allowed the flag carrier to flourish, the market simply isn't big enough to support a large number of airlines in the same manner as American equivalents. Prior to the outbreak of 2020, British Airways and its main international rival Virgin Atlantic were in a strong commercial position due to their own respective selling points and competitive business strategies, ones which would likely have not been possible under state control, and illustrates that the healthiest market is one supported by private carriers and liberalised regulation.